Knock, knock. Number one broker here for the number one hit maker. Thanks for swinging by, Carl. No problem, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is me, just the bass, add more guitar, maybe some drums. Wow, so many choices. Yeah, like Schwab. I can get full service wealth management, advice, invest on my own, and trade on Thinkorswim. <laughs> no, Carl is the only front man you need. Oh, I gotta take this, Carl. It's Schwab. Schwab! <laughs> Have a choice in how you invest with Schwab. Accelerate your market knowledge. Shift the perspective into full view. Real time example trades, a full hour of trading insights. I'm Tom White. I'm Kevin Hinks. Catch me on Fast Market, weekdays at noon on the Schwab Network. Fast Market, ready for you, ready to go at 12 p.m. Eastern on the Schwab Network. Good game, boys. Oh, this is just something like that. Oh, shit. Welcome back to the watch list. I'm Caroline Woods. Hoorah, now for a final look moving. at what to listen for from Jerome Powell's press conference. Let's bring in George Silas, senior markets correspondent here on the network. George, we've talked about the highlights. Rates unchanged. One rate cut potentially this year. Modest progress on inflation. But uh, as you took some time to look through the FOMC statement, what stood out to you? Well, there's a there's a couple things. I mean, I went through the, the summer of economic oh, projections, no. and I think this is AI something robot, we'll get in the AI next you know, few minutes or so as the uh, the press conference, robot, conference and question uh, questionnaire uh, commences. But uh, what's going on with the reason? Or what's the reason that they're looking at from a from a policy standpoint, or even from a committee standpoint, the adjustment of uh, inflation higher by two twenty basis points for both core PC and core uh, CPI. Uh, what's happening here, in, in essence, is is we essentially are getting some uh, some or fewer rate cut expectations, one versus the three this year, but they actually increased 2025's cut projections to 4.2. So what they're doing is essentially moving the, uh, the rate cuts forward in time towards 2025. And I think the questions are, you know, what's what's the rationale behind that adjustment? Uh, While well, at the same time, you know, it looks like to me maybe there's going to be some questions about why, and what sort of economic data are they looking at in terms of sort of critical economic data? They didn't make any adjustment on GDP or on employment, but they did certainly make an adjustment on federal funds, but also the PCE and of course CPI. So uh, I think at the Word. end of the day, it comes down to the market's reaction. You can see right now. In essence, is, is maybe the economy is still robust and strong, and so therefore, you know, one versus three rate cuts is, is most, uh, most uh, needed or, or ne not necessarily necessary, but markedly an adjustment on rates based upon the fact that we've made some progress on inflation, but we're not necessarily near the, uh, the benchmark of 2%, at least for CPI, but also from a core PC standpoint. Don't yeah, that that modest progress on inflation that the Fed mentioned in the statement. But I do think it's important to note, George, that in the CPI report, shelter inflation rose 0.4 percent in May and was up 5.4 percent from a year ago. We know that's been a sticking point for the Fed. I'm, I have a feeling Chair Powell will be asked about that in, in this press conference. But could that be the reason that the inflation expectations are ticking higher and uh, the, the yep. rate cut expectations are going lower? Yeah, I surmise that could be the culprit, and I think there will be a little bit more clarity uh, as we move forward in the next 30 minutes on that. So maybe some of the interest rate sensitive areas, the housing. I noticed that you know obviously the the, the bank stocks have fallen since the uh, the uh, the release of no the, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 statement, not the press conference, but the release of the statement. So you know, ideally speaking, you know the things we can take from what we have right now are. You know, one, fewer rate cut expectations may be a good sign that the economy can handle higher rates. Uh, and two, you know, you know, going forward, uh, what are they looking at in 2025? And in other words, pushing those rate cuts into 2025 versus 2024. George, want to get your take on the market reaction that we've seen so far, not just from this announcement, but the fact that uh, we saw really the stock shoot out of the gate after the CPI report. The Fed's talking about this modest progress on inflation, but the, the gains that we've seen today based on that report have not been modest. They're off the highs already of the session, but still really holding on to those gains. Any surprise based on the fact that the Fed is saying they're only going to cut one time? 
Well, that's the thing. So that's my point is, is that I think that the market, at least right now, the interpretation I, I'm, I'm gleaning from it is that um, not having, you know, three rate cuts, in other words, moving it down to one is a sign that the economy is still robust and can handle high rates. And that's what I'm what I'm surmising is happening here. But, you know, what I expected to happen was potentially going from three to two to be more in line with what the market expected. Uh, but again, you know, I was surprised by the one versus the three cuts that they had back in March. So, you know, right now what I see is happening is, is there's a continuation in mega caps. I thought we would probably see a, a rotation out of the mega caps into the more interest rate sensitive areas of the market, which had been performing exceptionally well earlier today and are still higher, but they've come come back off those highs. And these are areas that are associated with home builder products and some of the banks. Uh, and nonetheless, you know, some of the small caps as well, which are, 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 are full of, or at least I do, the Russell 2000 is full of regional banks. Yeah, although I was taking a look, Redfin, Zillow, Compass, we're having a great day today and still holding on to double-digit gains yeah. today. So uh, I think that's important to know. Even, you know, Lennar still up about 2%. Uh, real estate, one of the best-performing sectors, of course, behind technology today. If you were there, George, and you could ask Chair Powell a question, what would you ask? Well, I certainly would I ask him about why they made the adjustment 20, 20 basis points higher on PC and core CPI. I think that's really what everyone is going to be looking at. Uh, ideally speaking, I think that the culprit is, is what you allude to is, you know, owner's equivalent rent or essentially housing. And that's been very expensive and it's going to be tough to come down, especially looking at monthly data, which we are all focused on, uh, because we know that rents don't reset on a monthly basis. They're typically seasonal. You know, generally in the summertime, about four months of the year where they're reset. So that could be the issue. And if that is the issue, you know, that might not necessarily be hawkish or be interpreted as hawkish. It just means that we're going to have to be patient and have to deal with some elevated, you know, inflation closer to 3% versus the benchmark of two, which is their target. All right, we're waiting for Powell to get to the podium, so I'm going to ask you another question, but I may cut you off, George. Just in terms of, okay. uh, you talked about moving forward those three potential rate hikes later on. Does, is this a market that cares about really what's going to happen in 2025 and beyond? Actually, George, hold that thought. Well, we're going to yeah. uh, go to Powell. He's just getting to the podium right now, so let's see what he has to say, and I'll see you on the other side of this. Good afternoon. My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on achieving our dual mandate goals of maximum employment and stable prices for the benefit of the American people. Our economy has made considerable progress toward both goals over the past two years. The labor market has come into better balance with continued strong job gains and a low unemployment rate. Inflation has eased substantially from a peak of 7 percent to 2.7 percent, but is still too high. We are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal in support of a strong economy that benefits everyone. Today, the FOMC decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. We are maintaining our restrictive stance of monetary policy in order to keep demand in line with supply and reduce inflationary pressures. I'll have more to say about monetary policy after briefly reviewing <clears throat> economic developments. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has continued to expand at a solid pace. Although GDP growth moderated from 3.4 percent in the fourth quarter of last year to 1.3 percent in the first quarter, private domestic final purchases, which excludes inventory investment, government spending, and net exports, and usually sends a clearer signal on underlying demand grew at 2.8 percent in the first quarter, nearly as strong as the second half of 2023. Growth of consumer spending has slowed from last year's robust pace, but remains solid. And investment in equipment and intangibles has picked up from its anemic pace last year. Improving supply conditions have supported resilient demand and the strong performance of the U.S. economy over the past year. In our summary of economic projections, committee participants generally expect GDP growth to slow from last year's pace, with a median projection of 2.1 percent this year and 2.0 percent over the next two years. In the labor market, supply and demand conditions have come into better balance. Payroll job gains averaged 218,000 jobs per month in April and May, a pace that is still strong but a bit below that seen in the first quarter. 
The unemployment rate ticked up, but remains low at 4 percent. Strong job creation over the past couple of years has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers, reflecting increases in participation among individuals aged 25 to 54 years and a continued strong pace of immigration. Nominal wage growth has eased over the past year and the jobs to workers gap has narrowed. Overall, a broad set of indicators suggest that conditions in the labor market have returned to about where they stood on the eve of the pandemic relatively tight but not overheated. <clears throat> FOMC participants expect labor market strength to continue. The median unemployment rate projection in the SEP is 4.0 percent at the end of this year and 4.2 percent at the end of next year. Inflation has eased notably over the past two years but remains above our longer run goal of 2 percent. Total PCE prices rose 2.7 percent over the 12 months ending in April excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 2.8 percent. The consumer price index, which came out this morning and tends to run higher than the PCE price, PCE price index, rose 3.3 percent over the 12 months ending in May, and the core CPI rose 3.4 percent. The inflation data received earlier this year were higher than expected, though more recent monthly readings have eased somewhat. Longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households and businesses and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. The median projection in the SEP for total PCE inflation is 2.6 percent this year, 2.3 percent next year, and 2.0 percent in 2026. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship <clears throat> as it erodes purchasing power, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. Our monetary policy actions are guided by our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. In support of these goals, the committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent and to continue reducing our securities holdings. As labor market tightness has eased and inflation has declined over the past year, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals have moved toward better balance. The economic outlook is uncertain, however, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. We've stated that we do not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range for the federal funds rate until we have gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. So far this year, the data have not given us that greater confidence. The most recent inflation readings have been more favorable than earlier in the year, however, and there has been modest further progress toward our inflation objective. We'll need to see more good data to bolster our confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2 percent. We know that reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress that we've seen on inflation. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate, the committee will carefully assess incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. <clears throat> In our SCP, for FOMC participants wrote down their individual assessments of an appropriate path for the federal funds rate based on what each participant judges to be the most likely scenario going forward. If the economy evolves as expected, the median participant projects that the appropriate level of the federal funds rate will be 5.1 percent at the end of this year, 4.1 percent at the end of 2025, and 3.1 percent at the end of 2026. But these projections are not a committee plan or any kind of a decision. As the economy evolves, assessments of the appropriate policy, policy path will adjust in order to best promote our maximum employment and price stability goals. If the economy remains solid and inflation persists, we're prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds rate as long as appropriate. If the labor market were to weaken unexpectedly, or if inflation were to fall more quickly than anticipated, we're prepared to respond. Policy is well positioned to deal with the risks and uncertainties that we face in pursuing both sides of our dual mandate. We'll continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting, based on the totality of the data and its implications for the outlook and the balance of risks. 
The Fed has been assigned two goals for monetary policy, maximum employment and stable prices. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping longer-term inflation expectations <clears throat> well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the long run. Our success in delivering on these goals matters to all Americans. We understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Steve Leisman, CNBC. Just wondering if you could walk me through the committee's average inflation forecast. Core PCE is now forecast to be 2.8% by the year end. It's already 2.75, and after today's number, there were several forecasts on the street that it would be 2.6 at the end of this month. Does that tell you um, that the average official expects no further progress in inflation, and in fact that it's going to get worse? And if you have this wrong, doesn't it mean that you sort of you, you could have wrong the uh, outlook for rates there? Yeah, so what's going on there is that um, we had very low readings uh, in the second half of last year, June through December, really. And we're now lapping those. So as you go through the 12-month window, a very low reading drops out, and a new reading comes in. The new reading gets added to the 12-month window. So um, it's just a, a slight element of conservatism that we're, we're assuming a certain level of, uh, of, of um, you know, incoming monthly PCE and core PCE numbers. We're assuming, you know, a good but not great numbers. And if you put that on top of where we are now, you get a very slight increase in the 12 month, uh, in the 12 month, uh, you know, reading. Now, do we have high confidence that that's right? No, it's just a kind of conservative way for forecasting things. If we were to get more readings like today's reading, then of course that wouldn't be the case. So it's just a forecasting device. I think, I think uh, let me say that we welcome today's reading and, and hope for more like that. But if it comes in, just to follow up, it comes <clears> in the way you forecast it, it would seem strange for you to be cutting rates at all in context of a rising core PCE. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we've, we've, what we said is that we don't think it'll be appropriate to, to reduce rates and begin to loosen policy until we have more confidence that inflation is moving back down to 2% on a, on a um, sustainable basis. And that's the, that's the test we've applied. I don't know that, I think if we, I don't know that this rules that in or out. I mean, really, it's a, it's a forecast, a fairly conservative forecast, month by month, that would lead to slightly higher uh, you know, 12 months rate rates by the end of the year. If we get, you know, good, better ratings than that, then you will see that come down or, or remain the same. If you're at 2.6, 2.7, you know, that's, that's a really good place to be. Nick. Nick Tamaros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Powell, if I look at the, the rate projections, I see uh, 15 of the 19 that are anticipating either one or two, cut this, two cuts this year, fairly evenly split between the two. And so I wonder if you could explain a little bit more the, the nuances of the differences there. Would two or three more inflation readings, like the one that we saw this morning, uh, make a September interest rate cut possible? So as far as the SCP <clears throat> part of that is concerned, um, as you know, I talk, to, I talk to all of the other participants on the FOMC every cycle, and we talk about their summer of economic projections and, and the dot, you know, their dot plot and everything. And what, you, what I hear and see is that people are looking at, at you know, a range of plausible outcomes, and in many cases, they're, they're, they're thinking, I don't really, you know, I can't really distinguish between two of these. They're so close for me. These are very close calls. But we ask them to write down the most likely one, so they do. And as I think you've, you've, as you've said, there's 15 of the 19 are, are kind of clustered around one or two. So I think I would look at, at, at all, I look at all of them as plausible, but I'd look at, uh, so I, th I think that does tell you kind of what the committee thinks. But what everyone agrees on is it's going to be data dependent. No one, no one brings to this or takes away from it that is on the committee a really strong commitment to a particular rate path. It's actually just their forecast and their, it's a combination of their 